Jesus Christ insisted that heaven is real. That's the only reason I believe heaven is real. I've never been to heaven. I hate to tell you, but Clemson is not heaven. But neither is Columbia. Neither is the Huskies in Storrs, Connecticut. No, heaven is an existence where we'll be loving God, loving each other for eternity with bodies combined with soul, with personhood, not just robots, but people who've chosen to love God with their heart, soul, mind, and strength. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Do not take this from me. You don't know me from Adam. Instead, read the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for yourself. Those are the source documents. And ask yourself, does the evidence point to Jesus being reliable? If it does, you'd be very wise to trust Jesus when he promises heaven to all who believe in him. I've read like online that Mithra, Osiris, uh, Shiva, and all of these various yep. different religions that they died rose again on the third day, had the birthday of December 25th. So how are they um, any different than Jesus? Even Ra is called the sun god, which we know of Jesus as the son of God. So how is how are they any different? And how can we say that Jesus is the only way when other people have done what he's done? Good question, Stuart. Well, uh, some of those were made up by the Nazis to basically much later on, because think about it, why would Jews steal a universal, universalistic Gentile form of God, right? They would be the last ones to steal that. So, so the Jews of the day would not say, Jewish Messiah comes, lives, dies, raised on the third day. And that wouldn't make any sense. So looking into some of those religions, actually, Nazis created them during World War II to proliferate in such a way to show that, basically, Jews are idiots. So that, that would be the, my first point. My second point would be, you still have to look at the historical Jesus, right? Those stories, they mimic what happened with Christ, absolutely. But there's no historical reference to those gods being actual humans. They're mythical characters. But now you have Jesus Christ, you know, over 98, what is it, like 99% of scholars in the U.S. believe that Jesus existed as a historical figure. Similarly, just about as high, believe that he died on a cross. And so that's very different, obviously, from some pagan god, even if that god, again, mimicked hundreds, thousands of years before Christ. But you take that and then you say, okay, you have the resurrection now, and what's the evidence there? So even though it's strange, some of the mimicry, but then also how the Nazis made up a lot of those religions, and then now still looking at the historical claims of Christ, was he a historical figure, and was there the evidence for the resurrection, you can be fully secure in that because of who Jesus is. Similarly, you have, you know, the Titan is another one, the Titanic. The Titan also went down in a very similar way as the Titanic. So you have these things that occurred before that mimic in such a crazy kind of way. That would be my last point when it comes to religions mimicking Christianity. All right, it's a fascinating question. Good answer, Stuart. First point is, Mithraism. Where did it begin? area of Iran. What did it teach? It taught Mithra. Some people try and say, oh, that's a Christ figure. No, Mithraism is not a Christ religion. Mithraism is an incredible legend, and it doesn't claim to be an historical narrative. It's a legend, and there are some similarities between Mithra and Christ. But when you study Mithraism carefully, you will notice that there are fundamental contradictions between Mithra and Christ. Mithra comes out of a rock. No, Christ doesn't come out of a rock. And there are other differences like that. Secondly, you're right. In Egypt, there was a worship of Isis, Horus, and Osiris. And one of them died. And they went to the underworld but his sister found the different severed pieces of his body and put them all back together again, except for one part that was missing, a rather important part for any male that was missing. To argue that that is similar to the resurrection of Christ 
is a ridiculous argument. So yes, there are certain parallels, but just think about Iris, Osiris, and Horus in the Egyptian religion. What are they? They're sphinx-like characters. Well, have you ever seen a sphinx? It's half animal, half person. No, the claim of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is not that Jesus is half animal, half person. He was a real human being, but his claim was to be more than a human being, to actually be God in human form. But to try and make a parallel between a sphinx-like figure out of Egyptian mythology and the historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, is so intellectually dishonest, it's pathetic. So yes, are there similarities in all the major world religions? Yes, ma'am, there are. But there are also fundamental contradictions. Jesus was no sphinx. He was a real human being. Why would God put the tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden if he knew exactly what was happening? Good. Stuart, why did God put the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden of Eden? What's he playing games with us? That's right? a great question. So he knew what was going to happen, but he also knows the end game. He had to give us free will in order for us to make our own decisions. You have to have free will in order to love. He did not will what was going to happen with Adam and Eve, but he was outside of space and time, so he knew it would happen. If you can think up of a better way how God could have done it in terms of giving us free will, our own options, an opportunity to love or hate him, then we can talk. But I've never heard an atheist or a Christian come up with a way where there could be a relationship and a response to God's unconditional love or response to, like we were talking about, loving evil instead of God. So it is fascinating. It does seem like because he's outside of space and time, why couldn't he have set it up in such a way where he knew there wouldn't be any type of suffering and he could just get to the end game, which is we will get to the end game. It is the perfect story in many ways, obviously. Heaven, eternity with him and deciding on that. So if there's a better story, perhaps we can think of it. But again, it's, it's the perfect story in the sense of explaining a great fall. We see that great fall in all of our hearts. We see it in evolution. We see it in natural disasters. That makes sense. So even with natural disasters, you see that great fall starting with the tree. You see it at a sociological level, breakdown of relationships, divorce, family. Then you see it at a psychological level where Adam and Eve had tremendous shame and guilt. They were walking with God in the cool of the day, which meant perfect relationship. I mean, think about it. Perfect relationship, perfect relationship with God would mean always happiness, always joy, always peace, always a source of goodness completely around you. But that was severed when they decided, you know what, I'm going to turn from God. I'm going to say, God, get out of my life. Or at least, God, you are deceiving me in the sense of, you're saying there's only one good source when there's so many trees around here. I, I don't think you really have the best for my life. So I'm going to turn to other options. I mean, we see that all the time, right? Everybody worships something. And typically, if you worship something other than God, you're going to have tremendous breakdown in your life. Think about, for example, work and finances. We were just talking, Alexis and I, about Japan. There are terms for working yourself to death in Japan, largely based out of a shame and honor culture, then if you can't provide for your family, it's better to commit suicide than keep living. And this terminology of working yourself to death is based off of largely the culture of shame and honor, but also of worshiping work. So how God set it up, even though it's a great question, because I've always struggled with that one. He's outside of space time. He knew it was going to happen. But the story is so perfect. And that story is what every single movie, every single written fiction always gets at good, evil, struggling with evil and suffering, and then good, triumphing over evil. And that's reflected not just in our Judeo-Christian culture, but universalistically. And so give a better story, my atheist friend, than this one. And give a better story than our desire for unconditional love. And from an evolutionary perspective, how do you make sense of all of us wanting unconditional love that's something outside of Things like, I need to get A's on all my exams. I need to be the perfect child, the perfect parent. 
I need to somehow make myself great in order to have value. And it all starts there in the garden. It all starts with God knowing about it, but he doesn't will them to sin. He gives them free will. And it, we see how evil comes into play, but ultimately how good conquers evil. What is being baptized in the spirit? And how is that different from uh, what we do in churches being baptized, fully submerged underwater? How is that different from being baptized in the spirit? Paul puts it this way in Colossians 3, verse 1. He says, since you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above. In other words, you died, Cliff, to your sinful nature. You repented of your sin. You put your faith in Jesus. Now you're raised with him. You come spiritually alive to God. That's what Jesus is talking about in John 3 when he says to Nicodemus, religion is not enough. Morality is not enough. You need to be spiritually born again. Come spiritually alive to God what he's talking about so when you and i put our faith in christ we are baptized with the holy spirit we come alive to christ spiritually that's the holy spirit's work then out of obedience to christ we're to be baptized by immersion and what is that that is a symbol an outward symbol of an inner reality i died to my sinful nature i go under the water I come up out of the water, that symbolizes rising to live a new life of obedience to Jesus as Lord of my life. And we're gonna baptize a bunch of people this summer at our church back up in Connecticut who have done exactly that. They've repented of their sin, they've asked Christ for forgiveness, they put their faith in him, they've been born again, or whatever you wanna call it, you don't have to use the word born again. I find it interesting that Jesus uses the term born again in John chapter 3, talking to Nicodemus. Next chapter, John chapter 4, he's talking to a woman outside the town of Sychar. Never once does he use the word born again. Instead, he talks about himself being living water. Different metaphor, different figure of speech. Okay? So, the point is, though, when you genuinely put your faith in Christ, you want to obey him. And so you celebrate communion with other believers, and you also get baptized, which is you go under the water, symbolizing dying to your sinful nature. You come up out of the water, symbolizing rising to live a new life of obedience to Christ. There's a tricky passage in the book of Acts where the disciples have to go down to a specific group of people in order to baptize and give them the Holy Spirit because supposedly they're getting baptized but not receiving the Holy Spirit. Now, that was clearly a one-off, just like the born-again language. I am not against born-again Christian. It comes with a lot of baggage these days, so to an atheist, you're going to have to explain what does that mean without the cultural baggage. And yet in the book of Acts there, again, it's a one-off of the disciples coming down, baptizing, and then the Holy Spirit comes. It's not some superpower that the disciples have. When Jesus receives the dove, that's the Holy Spirit coming. And right there you get the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when he is being baptized. This is my Son, who I'm well pleased with. So the Trinity is right there in Jesus' baptism. But again, don't never look at baptism as something you have to do before you are saved. Because automatically that excludes a lot of people. And that turns it into works righteousness. I literally have to go to a priest or I have to go to somebody to dunk me under the water in order to get me into heaven. That sounds a lot more like a Hindu type of religion or a Buddhist type of religion or even Islam than a type of grace-based religion where Christ comes to save us, not us to save ourselves. My question is, how much power do sinful thoughts have over us versus what we actually say and act upon? So Martin Luther talks about how we're not responsible for the birds that fly over our head. We're responsible for allowing those birds to nest in our hair. So right there, Martin Luther, I could not agree with him more. If you try, so I'm glad you're asking this because as a therapist, I deal with this all the time, right? Not, not just for myself, but people I'm, I'm counseling as well. If you try and take every thought and put it under a microscope and dissect it in a way where it's, oh, was that an evil thought, a good thought? Was that a lustful thought? Hey, am I sinning right now? Hey, you're going to be mentally unhealthy. You just will. Just like if a male doesn't lust, they probably have some level of depression or some level of other psychosomatic issue. You're going to have lustful thoughts. And if you're just beating up on yourself, saying I'm a dirty, rotten sinner going to hell for having those thoughts, I believe that's of the devil. So the thoughts come, but when Martin Luther says, don't let them nest in your hair, he's saying, don't entertain those thoughts right. of lust, of hate, of a desire then to slander. 
And that's similar to what Paul talks about. I believe it's 2 Corinthians 5.10, I want to say, when he says, take every thought captive, making it obedient to Christ. Again, Paul there is not saying, because he wrestles with lust, right? Yeah. He says all the time in Romans 7, for example, he does the things he doesn't want to do. And what he doesn't want to do, he does. So obviously Paul's wrestling with thoughts and actions. So yes, don't entertain. Take those thoughts captive. Then Philippians chapter 4 talks about whatever's true when you're thinking, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think on those such things. So shift the thinking. And that's why in secular culture, y'all, it's all about cognitive behavioral therapy. Question your thinking. Right. Well, that came right out of the Bible. Psalm 42, 3, for example. 42 and, and 43. It's repeated three times, the verse of why you downcast away, so why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God. Question those thoughts, change them, hope in God. So yes, if we're entertaining those thoughts, that is an action, a sin, just as bad in my mind as speaking them. But speaking them, the reason why James puts so much emphasis on the tongue as the spark to light a conflagration that just goes on forever is because the tongue starts in such a way where it's so hard to stop our sinful speech when you start. It is very difficult if you entertain gossip for a while to all of a sudden switch that. That is one of the toughest actions to make, I've found at least as a pastor and in my own life. So grading sins, I would say entertaining is probably just as bad as speaking. But once you get into grading sins, you've got to be careful because, you know, hatred and murder, obviously the consequences of murder are way stronger Hatred, I would look at as an acorn with an entire forest inside it, right? And we're all acorns having the potential of murder. Every Christian needs to look into their heart and say, I have the potential to murder. I have the potential to sleep with anybody and everybody, even in an enforced kind of way, a forceful kind of way. So difficult question, but again, Christians, the reason why so many psychologists who are secular hate Christianity is because of a symptom called religiosity. And that was really born out of this desire, partly, to say, oh, you're sinning in that thought. You're sinning in that thought. came out of thought-action fusion. So I knew a guy who, you know, whatever causes you to sin, if your hand does it, cut it off. I knew a guy, a Christian, who cut off his hand. Oh. All right, so, so look, if we misinterpret Scripture like that, I don't, I don't think Jesus is saying that, right? Yeah. Contextually speaking. I, I don't think everybody was walking around, all his disciples, with missing, missing limbs. So the importance of interpretation and what Jesus talks about is crucial. So if you look at the city of, well, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, like how terrible they were yeah. for God to literally smite them off the planet. Yes. How can you like compare that to today's society where we have like so much evil like going around? Like, yeah. Why would God like smite them but not smite what's going on today? Very good question. I think that if God doesn't judge America soon, he's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. All right? Yeah. Now, second point. Oh, that is really warped, Cliff. You think that God judges. Oh, that's a mean, mean God. Oh, really? Wait till you become a father. I can promise you, if anybody tries to brainwash your kid, you will be all over him like a wet blanket. Why? Because you know you don't want anybody messing with your kid's brain. Don't give me this gibberish that you don't judge. You better judge, and I better judge. Why? Because there's a boatload of good in this world, and there is a boatload of evil in this world. And if anybody, if any woman on this campus gets date raped, and you don't make a judgment call, that's evil. I don't think you have a conscience that's working very well. I don't think you know what it means to love a fellow student at this fine university. No. Date rapists, cut it out now. It's wrong. Oh, Cliff, that's a judgment. Yeah, you bet it's a judgment. You racist. Guess what? Cut it out. Oh, that's a judgment, Cliff. Yeah, that's right. That is a judgment. Watch out, you guys who live promiscuous lives sexually. Oh, that's a judgment. Well, yeah, it's a judgment. Well, I thought Jesus said, judge not, lest to be judged. Yeah, he did say that. But what does he mean? In Matthew 7, 1, Jesus says, judge not, lest to be judged. You know what he says 14 verses later? Beware of false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but they're ferocious wolves on the inside. 
So when Jesus says, judge not, does he mean suspend your critical thinking and blindly say everything's equally valid? No, he doesn't. Because 14 verses later, he says, watch out for false prophets. In other words, retain your critical, analytical thinking, because that's a gift from God. And use your critical, analytical thinking to distinguish between truth and lies, between good and evil. So what does it mean that do not judge? The judgmentalism that Christ is attacking is this. You know, I can't believe what you did, you lowlife. I would never stoop to that kind of evil. That's judgmentalism. It's arrogant self-righteousness, where I look down on other people as being moral misfits, and I view myself as being, oh, I got my act together. Yeah, Jesus says, don't do that. Instead, be honest and vulnerable, in touch with reality, and Cliff, you are a sinner. And therefore, when I walk into a prison cell in Massachusetts, and there's a guy there who has kidnapped, raped, and murdered little boys, and then I leave that cell, as I did every Monday night when I was in seminary, and I go to play basketball with the inmates, and they come up to me and say, hey man, don't you know what that dude did? He's a piece of dirt. I have to say to them, yes, I know what he did, but he's not a piece of dirt. He's a human being the same way you and I are. He's done some horrible, gross, evil things, but guess what? So have I. Not the same things, not on that order of magnitude ethically, but I'm a rebel against God. I need God's grace, his patience, his love, and so does that guy. And so therefore, he's not a piece of dirt. He's a human being creating the image of God who's gotten massively confused, done some horrible things, but God's grace reaches to him as well. Did I answer your question? Yes. Thank you so much for raising. Stuart, what would you add? Well, just the Old Testament. I, I love, biblically speaking, remember, Sports Center, top 10 nominee. That's what the Bible does in about 1,400 years, highlights a top 10 nominee. So you're not gonna see the top 10 nominee still lasting today. The book is closed, right? The Bible has been written, it's, it's closed. It's, it's not, there's nothing, no words gonna be added to it. Secondly, Old Covenant versus New Covenant. Theocracy, theocracy versus what God, I mean, through Jesus Christ allows, render under Caesar, what is Caesar's, right? At the, no longer do we have a theocracy. And now we even have a democracy. So God moves differently in hierarchy of leadership and government. You get before the new covenant, when Jesus comes, you get a different type of judgment. Sodom and Gomorrah, you see grace there, right? And how he works with Abraham in terms of the numbers. And God says, all right, all right, I'll allow it. I'll allow it. If there's 10, even 10 more people who are righteous within the city, I will allow it and will not smite the city and judge the city at this point. So tremendous grace God is showing even there. Now Jesus comes and you have him dying on the cross for us. So what happens? Judgment in this world looks different in the sense of no longer is there a one-to-one -one correlation typically with punishment. So it doesn't mean that Jesus no longer shows us guidelines and shows us that when we're doing wrong, we're doing wrong. And it does not mean that Jesus is radically different. All of a sudden he's completely changed from the God of the Old Testament and we have polytheism, two different gods. No, same God. But the judgment and punishment is gonna come in the spiritual heavenly realm where we have thank heaven for judgment day see i used to read in the psalms and other books when you have god talking and david is specifically talking to god about i cannot wait for judgment day i used to think that's grotesque that's disgusting but now i look at it and say that's one of the most beautiful things in the world who doesn't want a judgment day in the sense of as a pastor and therapist and what i do out here I see people who've come from the most horrendous upbringing and have been abused in such horrible ways that if you don't want a judgment day where justice is gonna ultimately win, ah, that's a pretty depressing life you're living. And see, I find it so interesting that in our culture today, we have so many people who wanna live for justice when it comes to race, when it comes to dealing with gender dysphoria, identity, you name it. And yet it's an angry kind of justice. It's like, I'm so ticked about this, but I have no real answer other than maybe, you know, law enforcement or other things. But if you look at biblical justice, 
no longer do you have to be angry about it because God is going to judge and God is good. He's the ultimate, beautiful judger of the universe. And so you have the same God in the old as the new, but punishment and judgment looks different with Jesus, especially when it comes to, it's going to be in the eternal realm. It's going to be with judgment day. So in the New Testament, when Jesus does like miracles and he sometimes like informs people to go tell and sometimes he doesn't, but yet we're commissioned to go tell. What was the purpose of him asking people to not share about the miracle that had been done? Well, ma'am, that's a very difficult biblical question you asked there. All right, it has a lot to do with Christ did not want false publicity. And false publicity was rampant in that day. Messiah, Messiah, where is the Messiah? And there was a very clear understanding of who Messiah was. He was the leader who was going to kick the Roman occupation force out of Palestine. In fact, that's a big reason that the Jewish leaders rejected Christ. Because he comes claiming to be Messiah, the Christ, and then he has nothing to do with forming an army and kicking the Romans out. And their total mindset was, Messiah will free us. Messiah will return us to David, the Davidic kingship of David. And he will rule, and there will be justice, and the lion will lie down with the lamb. And Christ says, no, that's not what I'm coming to do. Secondly, Christ claimed to be God in human form. And he claimed that his miracles pointed to his veracity. Wow. Wow, that caused a major short circuit in a lot of Jewish brains. God in human form? Are you kidding me? Jesus did not want people coming to him for the wrong reason. In fact, he accuses people of wanting to be around him, not because you really want the truth, but because you know that I fed 5,000 with five loaves and two fish, and that's why you're flocking. And he says, that's not why I've come to this earth. I have not come simply to feed the hungry. Is feeding the hungry important? Absolutely, yes. But I find it fascinating in Mark chapter 2, where a paralytic is lowered on a mat to the feet of Christ. Christ looks in the paralytic's face and says, your sins are forgiven. What? Get relevant, Jesus. The guy's a paralytic. Let's not talk about forgiving sin. Let's talk about getting healthy. No, Jesus didn't agree with that. He understood our sin separates us from God. It separates us from life with God now and for eternity. I'd like to invite you to Grace Community Church located at 365 Lukeswood Road in New Canaan, Connecticut. Our services are at 9.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. on Sundays. Hope you can join us.